I begin to just say, Lord, I don't want to just preach something just to preach. I want you to give me something that you want to say today. And the title of my message today is, How Can He? <sighs> Forgive me. How can he forgive me? And as I was preparing this, I think I got the spirit of Tom on me. As I was preparing this, uh, the revelation, if you will, or the illumination of this particular portion of Scripture just spoke to my heart so deeply and I, and I just began to weep and weep and weep and weep as I was preparing it. And, and I said, well, Lord, if this is what you want me to share, I will. And So I'm going to be sharing out of, of course, my Bible here, but I'm going to be reading from the, the Message Bible and also from the Living Bible because it really brings things into clarity. I don't uh, normally preach out of the Message and I won't use it as a major... Um, Bible, because I, I believe that uh, there's some errors and so forth, but anyway. <clears throat> when I think of the goodness of Jesus, and I think of, you know, as that song was, she was singing, and, and it says, you don't know, you don't know where I was when he came and wrapped his arms around me. You don't know what I was, you don't know. Many of you would not have liked me before I was a Christian. I was very self-centered. I was very mean. Uh, I could tell you where to go, how to go, and how fast to get there. And when I look into the things of Jesus and I looked into this passage of Scripture, it just so touched my heart. And, and so I want to share it with you. If you turn with me, please, if you have your Bibles, and please forgive me for being emotional this morning. In Luke chapter 7. In Luke chapter 7. Starting with verse 36. And one of the Pharisees asked him over for a meal. And when he went to the Pharisee's house and sat down at the dinner table, just then a woman of the village, the town Hallet, having learned that Jesus was a guest in the home of the Pharisee, came with a bottle of very expensive perfume and stood at his feet weeping, raining tears on his feet. And letting down her hair, she dried his feet and kissed them and anointed them with the perfume. And when the Pharisees who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man was the prophet I thought he was, he would have known what kind of a woman this is who is falling all over him. And Jesus said to him, Simon, I have something to tell you. And he said, oh, tell me. He said, two men were in a debt to a banker. One owed 500 silver pieces, the other 50. And neither of them could pay up. And so the banker canceled both debts. Which of the two would be more grateful? Simon answered, I suppose the one who was forgiven the most. That's right, Jesus said. Then turning to the woman, but still speaking to Simon, he said, Do you see this woman? I came to your home. You provided no water for my feet. But she has rained tears on my feet and did them and dried them with her hair. You gave me no greeting. But from the time I arrived, she hasn't quit kissing my feet. You provided nothing for 
freshening me up, but she has soothed my feet with perfume. Impressive, isn't it? She was forgiven many, many sins, and so she is very, very grateful. If the forgiveness is minimal, the gratitude is minimal. Then he spoke to her, I forgive your sins. Those that sat with the dinner guests talking behind his back, who does this man think he is for forgiving sins? But he ignored them and he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. In the opening scriptures, the verse starts out with just one man and his friends asking Jesus to come and have lunch with him. And one would think that since this is happening quite, quite often, there was no particular reason why this occasion would be any different than any other. But I want you to know something this morning, that all of you, all of you here may think, well, it's just another Sunday service. But I got news for you. Something wonderful is going to take place here today. And I believe it. Because this truth that was recorded in the Bible is going to set some people free today. I would like you to notice the phrase, one of the Pharisees asked him over for lunch. What do we know about the Pharisees? What do we... What are we told about the Pharisees? We know they were head of the synagogues and in charge of the religious uh, duties performing in the synagogue, but what do we know about them, really? And we can only know what's true about them when we find in the Bible. And Jesus knew them quite well. He walked with them and he sat and talked with them. And if anyone could be an expert on the Pharisees, it would be Jesus because he knew them very well. Let's see what some important information he gave to us about the Pharisees. Let's look at Matthew 23. We'll come back to, of course, uh, Luke in a moment. But let's look at Matthew 23, verses 1 to 3. And the title that's found in the, in the Message Bible is Religious Fashion Shows. I thought that was pretty interesting. It says, Now Jesus turned to address his disciples along with the crowd they had gathered with them. The religion scholars and Pharisees, or scribes and Pharisees, are competent teachers, he said, in God's law. You won't go wrong in following their teachings on Moses. Now who was he talking to? He was talking to his disciples. He was telling his disciples... It's not wrong to, to follow what they're talking about in, in the book of Moses. But be careful about following them. They talk a good line, but they don't live it. They don't take it into their hearts and live it out in their behavior. It's all spit and polish veneer. In other words, what Jesus was saying is that they were hypocrites. They were coming before people and pretending to be something that they were not. And it's very, very important for you to understand that because it goes in correlation to our story about the Pharisees inviting Jesus over for lunch to come and have lunch with them, and why it would be that this woman would come uninvited to this luncheon. So back to our teaching this morning. The scripture said that a woman, this term was used in a very bad way at times. It had a connotation to it. And in explaining what kind of woman this is in the newer versions, the newer versions state that she was 
a woman of the street are a prostitute. And we know what that, enti- what that entails. But I want to ask you a question this morning. What happened in this woman's life to get her to the point where she was making a living in this way? It's so easy for you and I, like the Pharisees, to judge by the outward appearance of things and looking at the outward circumstances of life and seeing a person such as a prostitute and make judgments against her and call her different names as the Pharisees called her a whore and called her someone that was a woman of the streets and a woman of the night and and made the judgments upon her. But yet, it's very interesting that though they were making these judgments on her, they were not even living right. They were living a pretense. They were living something that was not true. And yet, to the the world that was there, they were representing the religious system, if you will, of their time. But what happened in this woman's life to get her to the point of making a living in this way? Now, what I'm about to suggest to you is strictly what I think could be some of the reasons. It's only conjecture, of course, and could only possibly be some of the reasons. But I believe that historically it may be some of the reasons that may be justified in what I'm going to say. Number one, if you go back all the way from Genesis all the way through, parents during this time period believed that a son was better than a daughter for several reasons. You look at Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and and the sons. You you see, all the sons are mentioned. Because a son to them meant one thing. That if they had a son, it could very possibly be that they would be the one to bring in the birth of the Messiah. Hello. And so having a son was a great honor. It was a a great... uh, a position to be in because you had a son now. And this son may just be the Messiah. We didn't, they didn't know. Other reasons could be that because a son would continue the posterity of a family line. Because if a son would grow up to be a man, he would take on a wife, she would take on his name, And they would produce more children and more sons and then so forth and so on. And so the son is really the the one that really brings a posterity to the line of the genealogy, if you will, of the promise. Son will also continue the family name. Not only will he be a blessing to his children and to his grandchildren, as Abraham was to Isaac and as Isaac was to Jacob. You remember, it was the parent at that time had a responsibility. And I believe that us parents today, those who are parents, you have a responsibility to speak positively over your children. To lay your hands upon their heads, your right hands upon their heads, and pronounce blessing upon them. That's your duty. It's no wonder our children are so messed up today because they're coming from one one parent families and they're missing the element that God had intended is the father to come and to pronounce blessings upon his children, upon his family. And how blessed a wife can be if the if the husband is living a godly a life and how blessed a woman can be if, she, if he's loving her as Christ loves the church and nurturing her and, and, and taking care of her and ministering to her and encouraging her and lifting her up. And who, what woman would not want to serve a man like that? What, what woman want, would not submit herself to a... Sorry about that, lost my power.
how a woman will be truly blessed and will truly submit herself to a man who follows the scriptural mandate. It's so sad because I even see grown men sometimes yelling at their children the four-letter word and swearing and cursing at their children. And then you wonder why the children, and like especially in my neighborhood, I, when the summertime is, is around and the windows are open and I can hear these little kids, six, seven, eight years old, saying all kinds of sexual perverted things and all kinds of cursing and swearing coming out of their mouth. And I know where it comes from. It starts at home. And how a son is supposed to be an honor to his father. It's supposed to bring honor and dignity. Maybe this woman, when she was born, maybe she felt a sense of disappointment. Maybe they spoke words of rejection to her. Maybe you find yourself in the same position as this woman when you grew up in life with your parents and they, and they spoke negative things to you and, and spoke all kinds of evil against you and said how wicked and how bad you were. And I want you to know that a father's rejection to any child can have a major impact on their lives even before they're born. Quite possibly this woman had gone through so many hurtful, painful uh, experiences in her life, rejection in her life. Because I don't believe this girl just grew up one day and went to her mom and dad and said, Hey mom and dad, I want to be a prostitute. There was extenuating circumstances in her life. Maybe it was social, economical. Or maybe it was introspective. Maybe something deep inside of her was hurt. Maybe it was a relationship that she was promised to someone. Maybe she wasn't that great looking. Or that desirable. And she was promised to somebody because that's how they did marriages back then. They were promised. And maybe when the time came for the, for the groom to come and, and inspect the wife, he looked at her and says, I don't want her. And rejected her. We don't know. But these are things that happen in everyday life. People that are rejected in everyday life. And some of them, to help with the pain, to help with the, the things that they go through, and, and the turmoil that's inside of them, many of them turn to alcohol, many of, the, many of them turn to drugs, heroin, crack, whatever it may be, to try to escape the pain and the sorrow and the hurt that has been caused in their life. There are things that happen in life that transpire in, a, uh, in our lives that causes us sometimes to make unwise decisions and choices. Especially when others have hurt us. Can you imagine? Here's the setting, okay? They were having lunch. They were having lunch, then all of a sudden, a woman, a prostitute, comes in and stands behind Jesus. Now let me say this. I don't know if you've ever been around people that think they're something. I don't know if you've ever been around people who think that they're better than somebody else. Simply because of their status, either economically, financially, or socially, whatever. And they almost talk down to you like you're nothing. How many have ever experienced that? I've experienced that. I never forget the time uh, when the Christian bookstore was on Union Street and it was owned by uh, Charlotte and her husband. Some of you know who, they, who I'm talking about. And her husband, was, they were uh, Baptists, but uh, her husband took a liking to me and invited me to um, one of the evangelical 
uh, conferences of, of the time. They had it at the, uh, the Heinz Auditorium in Boston. It was a big, big thing. and It was very prestigious. And they had all the uh, PhD doctorates that were from Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary. They were doing all of the workshops and everything. So it was a very high thing and, you know, very socially thing. And you know your pastor, I'm a cut-up sometimes. I can be serious, but I can be a cut-up sometimes. Okay. And uh, so he, he wanted to take me. He, wanted to, he invited me. He wanted me to go with him. So I went with him. And we went in to register. And you know how they give you those hello, my name tag things that are over there? So I took a magic marker and I put on it, Bob, D-E, I'm uh, sorry, D-A, C-L-A-Y. And so when I stuck it on, he looked over and he read it. And he, he, his eyeballs roll. I can still see him. His eyeballs roll. He says, man, what are you doing? You're going to embarrass me. What I said, no, I'm just going to have some fun. Because you could tell they were all very stuffy. You know, they were very stuffed shirt, you know. They had the little gold rim glasses. And, you know, they were like, hello, and hello, you. And, you know, all that kind of stuffy stuff. So uh, we're walking around. And finally this lady comes from somebody that he knew and, and she's, she's like, oh, hello, how are you? You know, whatever his name was. I forgot what his name was. But, you know, hello, how are you? And, and what are you doing? And he says, oh, I'm fine, fine. And I'm just standing. She goes, and you? And she bends over and looks at my name tag. She goes, Bob, De Clay. De Clay, I never heard of that name before, De Clay. And I said, you never read in the Bible where he said, he is the part or I am De Clay? And she went, oh, 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 and she walked out. I love doing stuff like that. Because it makes people reveal, it makes them reveal who they really are, you know. I, I kind of like doing little stuff like that. The clay... So imagine, here, here she comes and she's standing behind Jesus. She found out that Jesus was in this place. Now, I want you to understand now. It was not easy for her to be there. Are you hearing me? You're talking about a house that was a Pharisee's house that was prominent throughout the region that was there. Everybody knew this Pharisee because, you know, the Pharisees, they put on the big show. That's what Jesus said. They live a big show, but they don't, they talk a big show, but they don't live it. And so she had to humble herself, knowing that by going into that home, that house, that Pharisee's house, knowing that even probably some of the Pharisees were her customers, Hello? The hypocrisy, the judgmental attitude, the putting down of this person, of, of her kind, saying different mean things. You know how religious people are, they're very mean. It says when she knew that Jesus sat at me at the Pharisee's house, she got wind of it. Somehow she heard about this Jesus. Somehow she must have known of, the, of a man that was filled with compassion and mercy and love and grace and forgiveness. So what did she do? Did she sit back and say, well, if Jesus wants me, he has to come to me? No. She went into an environment that she knew she would have been ridiculed and mocked, made fun of. But she says, I don't care. I'm going to see him. And I'm going to read it from the uh, Living Bible. She probably heard that he was a man of hope too. A man who could possibly heal her broken heart and ease the pain of the loneliness that she felt all of her life. 
And next he does something that should have been done by the host of this luncheon. Let me get back to my living Bible here. Where is it? Yes, here it is. So one of the Pharisees asked Jesus to come to his home for lunch. Jesus accepted the invitation. As he sat down to eat, a woman of the streets, a prostitute, heard he was there and brought an exquisite flask filled with expensive perfume. Going in, she knelt behind him at his feet, weeping with her tears falling down upon her, his, face, uh, his feet. And she wiped them off with her hair and kissed them and, perfumed, and poured perfume on them. So here she is. She's humbling herself. She comes into this, this place. Bows down to the, to the ground. Brings the ointment that she had. Now understand, I want you to understand something. The money that was earned, that was very costly perfume. The money that she had earned by sleeping with men is how she purchased this perfume. I wonder if she ever thought that that gift was not worthy enough. Or wasn't clean enough. You have to understand one thing. If you, read about the, if you read about the priests in the Bible, no one could uh, come before a priest without first being anointed and cleansed. And that's what I loved when I saw this about Jesus. Is he a priest? Yes. Is he a king? Yes. But he allowed this woman who was unclean not only to come into his presence and to kneel before him, but also to touch him. That was unheard of. And so here this Pharisee, he sees this. He saw what was happening and he, says to, he said to himself, he said this to himself, This proves that Jesus is no prophet. For if God had really sent him, he would know what kind of woman this is. Are you hearing me? If this Jesus was truly a prophet sent from God, he would know what kind of woman this is. That's derogatory. That's a statement that's derogatory. If Jesus knew who this woman was, and who it was that touched him, this unclean, unholy, unrighteous woman, this prostitute, if he only knew he's no prophet. And I want you to understand and know that there are some people that come into church and they feel just like this prostitute did. They don't really know if God will forgive them. They don't really know if God will really love them. Won't really know if God will receive them because of all that they've done in their life. But I got some good news for you. It says, then Jesus spoke up, and he answered the thoughts. Aren't you glad that Jesus knows the thoughts and intents of the heart? This man didn't outwardly say anything, but he just thought it. And no, Jesus did not have ESP for all of you New Agers that may be listening on the CD. I hope there's no New Agers here in our sanctuary. He spoke up and he said, Simon, he said to the Pharisee, I have something to say to you. And I want you to understand, Jesus didn't rebuke the Pharisee at that moment. He didn't condemn the Pharisee. He was using something of an illustration that not only showed the love of this woman to him, 
but also the lack of love from him to Jesus. He said, all right, teacher, Simon replied, go ahead. Then Jesus told him this story. He says, a man loaned money to two people, 5,000 to one and 500 to another. But neither of them could pay him back, so he kindly forgave them both, letting them keep the money. Which do you suppose loved him most after all? And Simon answered and said, I suppose the one who had owed him the most. Correct, Jesus agreed. Verse 44. Then he turned to the woman and he said, Simon, look. See this woman kneeling here? When I entered your home, you didn't bother to offer me water to wash the dust from my feet. I want to stop there for a moment because I want to read you something. If I can find where I, what I did with it. I want to read you something. This is from the 1906 Jewish Encyclopedia. And I want to read this to you because it's important at the point of what I'm trying to, to make here. It says, uh, under the biblical data, foot washing. Since the Israelites, like other Oriental peoples, wore sandals instead of shoes, and as they usually went barefoot in the house, frequent washing of the feet was a necessity. Now listen to this. Hence, among the Israelites, it was the first duty of, a, of the host to give his guests water for the washing of his feet. Hmm. It was his first duty. It was the first duty of that Pharisee as a gesture of acceptance and love and friendship to offer water so they could wash their feet. The Pharisee didn't do that for Jesus. Listen to what it says. I'm going to jump down now. It says, just as no one is allowed to approach a king or prince without due preparation, which includes the washing of the feet in the, in the in, hands and feet, so the Israelites, especially the priests, is forbidden in his unclean condition to approach Yahweh, for he who comes defiled will surely die. It was the duty, it was the duty, to omit this was a sign of mocked unfriendliness. To avoid this custom would be to speak to that person in an, uh, or to represent that person in a very unfriendly manner. In other words, you're not really welcome here. You know, they say action speaks louder than words. This Pharisee's actions that did not even offer Jesus the water for his feet. Now watch this. Jesus said this. When he told, when the Pharisee answered him and said, you know, the one who, I guess, supposed the one who had owed him the most, Jesus, Simon answered, correct. Jesus said, agreed. Then Jesus said this. Then he turned to the woman, Jesus, and as he turned to the woman, he said to Simon, look, see this woman kneeling here? When I entered into your home, you didn't bother to offer me water to wash the dust off my feet. What he was saying is, you didn't even, you didn't even accept me as a friend. Not even as a friend. There was an ulterior motive that this Pharisee had in having Jesus in his house. Remember at times, the Pharisees wanted to plot to kill Jesus. Something was happening. And so here he says, you didn't offer me anything for my feet. But she has washed them with her tears and wiped them with her hair. Brother Tom, would you put up 1 Corinthians 11.15? Sometimes we read scripture so quickly. But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her. For her hair is given her for a covering. When she washed, 
When she washed Jesus' feet, she was bowing down her glory for the glory of the Lord. And she was saying, Lord, you are my covering. You are my covering. I'm wiping your feet with my hair because I'm showing you that you're my covering. You're my glory. It doesn't matter. These things don't matter anymore. It's not about my glory. It's not about my covering. It's about you. And I wanted you to get the heart of this woman. What she was trying to do. He says, she washed with her tears and wiped with her hair. He said, you, verse 45, he said, you refuse me the customary kiss of greeting. The oriental greeting, the, ancient, the greeting of the Israelites at the times where they would give a holy kiss. It didn't start with Brazilians and Portuguese. You kiss both cheeks. Sometimes I get confused because sometimes one does one and sometimes one does two. But that was a custom. The Arabians in, in, in Saudi Arabia, and when they greet one another, they, you see them, they, they greet one another with a kiss on both cheeks. Men. It's a sign of respect. It's a sign of honor, acceptance, love. He's saying to this Pharisee, you didn't even show me that. But she has kissed my feet again and again from the time I first came in. You neglected the usual courtesy of olive oil to anoint my head, but she has covered my feet with rare perfume. You didn't anoint my head with oil. It was a sign of blessing, receiving a blessing. It says, as respecter of the head of the house, you didn't even anoint my head with oil. You didn't even. But this woman took this perfume and she poured the whole thing, not regarding the cost. Think, of, think about it. How many men this woman had to sleep with to save up the money? To buy that costly perfume that she would perfume herself and her bed with in order to make it more desirable. And what she was saying is, Lord, this is my whole life. This is my whole savings. And the only real good thing it's for is to be poured out upon your feet. Because my life doesn't mean anything without you. All that I have is worthless. All that I strive for is worthless. And I'm proving it to you, Lord, that it doesn't mean anything to me anymore because I'm pouring it on your feet. And then he said this, in verse 47, he said, Therefore her sins, and they are many. When he made that statement, and they are many, understand that if he knew the thoughts of the Pharisee without the Pharisee speaking, he also knew all the sins that this woman had, had done. He knew of every single man that this woman had slept with and committing adultery with. Men that were probably still married. Hello? And he said, this woman who has sinned and has sinned much, has sinned many times. He said, therefore her sins, and they are many, are forgiven. Hello? Yeah. They are forgiven. For she loved me much. 
she went into that house not caring about who was going to say what about her. They were going to mock her, ridicule her, make fun of her, threaten her, throw her out of there. She was unclean. She was not even fit to be in that house because of this, quote, Pharisee. But Jesus said, you are forgiven. But he said for, verse 47, Therefore her sins, and they are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But one who is forgiven little shows little love. Let me ask you a question this morning. How much do you love the Lord? See, do you really understand the depths of your sin? Do you understand that your sin or sins were the very exact same sins that crucified Christ? It was for your sin that Jesus laid down his life for you. Do you understand the seriousness of your sin? Not only your past sins, but also your, your sins that you do now. On the Facebook page of For His Glory Christian Assembly, I, I put a video there quite a while back. Does he still feel the nail pit? Does he still feel the nails every time I sin? Does he still feel the nails every time I sin? Do you understand that how wretched and how miserable that you are no better than this prostitute? You are no better than this harlot? Because the Bible says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Hello? That God doesn't look at lying any more or less than he does at prostitution? Or someone who commits a murder any less than a con consistent liar? Hello? The penalty is the same. The penalty is the same. But somewhere in our pride and our arrogance, we think that we're, we're better, like that Pharisee. We're, we're, well, and you can, just, you can kind of think of it that way, too. If, if in the back of your mind right now, as you're sitting there saying, well, I'm not as bad as a prostitute, guess what? You're a Pharisee. You have just proven that you're a Pharisee because you have just proven that you're not as bad as such and such. That's what the Pharisee thinking was. I'm not bad, as bad as that person. I'm better than that person. I don't do that. Hello? We all sin and fall short of his glory. And one sin is just as greater than another. But to one who is forgiven little, that person loves little. Oh, but you know something? Let a, let a man fall in love with a woman. He'll open that door for her. He'll buy her flowers, take her out to dinner, want to spend every moment calling her on the phone, want to do everything. But what about loving God? Think of how a woman feels. If a man never pays attention to his wife, only, when, only one time and one time only, and that's when he wants to have sex. Hello? Hello? But otherwise, he doesn't talk to her, doesn't spend time with her, doesn't hold her hand, doesn't, doesn't pray with her, doesn't do anything with her. Think about how that woman feels. Now think about how Jesus feels. Oh, we want Jesus when we have, to have, a, we have a problem. Oh, we want Jesus to fix this. Oh, we want Jesus to fix that. We want Jesus to bless us. We want Jesus to do this. But we don't realize... When we think in our heads that we've been forgiven little, no, you're just as guilty as the greatest, most horrible, vile, filthy, dirty, rotten sinner that's out there. You and I, and I include myself, are just as rotten and miserable as they are. Now 
Now, I know that may shatter some of one, some, some people's egos. But I want you to know that when I was thinking about this and I was thinking of how much he loved me, how much he did for me, I couldn't help but weep to understand the depths of how I had sinned against him and hurt him and pained him in my life. And that he could still forgive me and could still love me. Still use me. But sometimes we take the attitude of the Pharisee. I lost my place. Then the men at the table said to themselves, Who does this man think he is going around forgiving sins? Jesus said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Go in peace. Are you in peace today? Do you have the realization of what Christ has done for you?